prepare for the discussion today, I read a fascinating research report by the American Psychological Association, which addressed the question, since everybody knows that, or most everybody knows that climate change is a problem, why isn't anybody doing anything about it? It's a question that, of course, applies equally well to population. And I think the answers they found are ones which will be useful to us to keep in mind this afternoon. They mentioned six facts, and one of them was habits. They said that we had adopted a set of habits which had the inadvertent consequence of causing climate change, and it's just very difficult to change our habits. Again, I think an analogous uh, line of reasoning would apply to population. And because of that, I'm going to do a very quick exercise which will give you an opportunity to be introspective about your own habits. So I have to ask you, please put down your pencils and the other things you're holding. Cross your arms. Look down and see which wrist is on top. And just remember which one it is, OK? Drop your arms. Great. Cross your arms. Look down and see which wrist is on top. And remember. OK, now drop your arms. So let's uh, conduct a little research poll here ourselves. All of you who had the same wrist up both times, raise your hand. Me too, of course. <laughs> Almost everybody, which, of course, is what you would hope for, because this issue, what you do with your arms when you actually want to focus your attention on something else, shouldn't take you 15 or 20 minutes every time <laughs> you need to deal with it. You need to find a habit that works for you and then use it. Uh, the interesting question, of course, is whether there's some optimum. So let's see about that. Everyone who had their left wrist up both times, raise your hand. Everybody who had your right wrist up. OK, so that, that's also interesting. It says that although we all tend to do it the same way, there's no optimal way to do it. We could do it one way, could do it the other. Our best hope for dealing with population is that it has similar features, that although we've gotten in the habit of conducting ourselves in one way, it's not required that we do that, and that we will be able to give people a new set of habits. It's going to be that hope which inspires my speech this morning and motivates my uh, conversations this afternoon. So I was assigned the topic, uh, economics and limits to growth, what's sustainable. I thought about that and concluded that the answer I would have given 40 years ago when I first started to address this question is different than the answer I give today. So let me take you back 40 years, give you a sense about our views at that time, and then come up to the present to see where we are today, because of course, that's where we have to take our policies. In uh, the period 1970, 1972, I worked with a group of people at MIT. We created a rather simple computer model to look at the causes and consequences of growth and population and other physical features of the globe. Uh, there was no sense, uh, certainly no pretense, that that was anything like a predictive effort. So we used it, as, for example, the climate community does today, to create a set of scenarios which would kind of, we hoped, bound reality. And this I'm showing you is the so-called reference scenario. Now, I have a laser pointer, and I'm going to point to the screen down there. Uh, I apologize for the few who are immediately underneath the screen. Probably you're not going to miss anything if you don't look. That's, uh, but you see right there is where we were in 1972, that vertical red line. And at that time, we still anticipated that there would be another 40 or 50 years of growth. Notice that I have blanked out the last quarter of this scenario. We didn't do that in the book, but I'm doing it here because we know that once growth does peak out and start going down, the global system will be changed in ways which make it totally impossible now for us to understand 
what's going to happen. Certainly our model wouldn't be at all relevant anymore. So I, rather than uh, distract attention from what I think is significant, I've just uh, eliminated it. And the black line shows you where we are today. And that blue boundary or, uh, is uh, essentially the period of time influenced by the policies that we might uh, undertake today. And notice that uh, they include a period when some of the key physical growth parameters quit growing and start declining. Here were the main insights from that effort. One is that we expected another 40 to 80 years of growth, which was back in 1970. Uh, since then, we've done two updates. And the two main things to say would be that nothing we've learned since then has caused us to alter our original conclusions, except to observe that things seem to be progressing a bit faster than we had expected. Uh, all of our growth scenarios showed ending some time in the period 2010 to 2050. Uh, we uh, observed, and I think actually this remains perhaps the unique contribution of the book, was that the growth wasn't going to end, as far as we could tell, in a nice orderly accommodation with its limits, but rather through overshoot and collapse. An impression which was a confirmed brilliantly by Catton, you know, when his book came out in 1980 with the title Overshoot. We experimented with radically different kinds of technology. I uh, was a professor at MIT. I have a degree in science. I worked in a national laboratory. I'm absolutely not anti-technology, and I'm also not uninformed about technology, but I have a fundamental understanding of how it originates and what it does. And what we could see is that with phenomenally optimistic assumptions, technology simply buys a little bit of time. It doesn't end the need for stopping growth and even doesn't push it back uh, very far. Useful to pursue new technologies, renewable energy, whatever you want to do, but we shouldn't imagine that that's going to solve the problem for us. Social changes are absolutely essential for attractive futures. Every single one of the sustainable scenarios that we portrayed were fundamentally dependent on changes in culture and in social aspirations. There's no, simply no way of using technological inventions to take us from a period of rapid growth over into one of stability.